All right, Christy, I'm going to turn it over to you, kiddo. Okay. Take All it right. away, Christy Lou. The premiere of The Deliverer by Jason William Park. A.D. 2038. The lightning took the two lane at 80. Upgrades over the years had kept the pickup ahead of most threats, like the sway bars that belied its bulk in the turns. Some original features received scant attention, such as the antimatter blue paint scheme gone dull. The neglected cosmetics threw the corporate decals into sharper relief. A dynamical ink logo was an honor for a delivery driver and a target. Bren alternated his gaze from the road before him to the intervening heads-up display projected onto his windshield to his rear-view cameras. A video call came up on the main touchscreen. Hey, Bren, got time to go live? Kenny Turo sat at a news anchor desk, receiving touch-ups to his hair. He traded his hoodie for a Bernini suit. His show had moved from his mother's basement to a world-class broadcast facility. Bren shrugged. They haven't started shooting yet. We'll catch that, too, Kenny said. The stage manager counted him in. A rock instrumental played as titles filled the screen. Delivery, dead or alive. Kenny flashed his winning smile. And we're live with the deliverer, Bren Van Allen. How do you feel about today's run? I'm proud to be carrying medical devices. Bren remained calm as he watched for interceptors. A need, not a want. Just a load for our voice of morality in the daily delivery battles. Kenny gave a conspiratorial grin. I think you might have some kills today. That's the biggest complaint the fans have about you. Not enough offense. I show up on time with deliveries intact. I stay alive for the next run. That's all the job requires. Will there be a day when you won't turn the other cheek? Kenny... If you think I'm such a pushover, why don't you fire up your ride and meet me on the road? See what happens. Bren smiled at his challenge. Snappy response. Once upon a time, I couldn't get two words out of you. A female voice came over the truck's speakers. Porch pirates are 600 yards behind, closing fast. Looks like the deliverer is about to engage. Kenny brought up multiple feeds from cameras on Bren's body and truck. Keep watching live on delivery, dead or alive. A squad of porch pirate vehicles approached the truck. On the touch screen, a grizzled face peered over a steering wheel. You have quite the rep, deliverer. Can't say I know you. Bren accelerated. Name's Lonnie. Got a whole crew coming for you. Hacked your manifest. You got a cool load of precious metals. Components of medical implants for children. Do I look like I give a... Bren switched off Lonnie's feed. Gunshots rang. Autonomous mode, Bren said into his smartwatch. The truck held chorus with his voice command. Bren pushed a red button on the side of his driver's seat. The rear of the cab swung open, and Bren's chair slid on rails onto the cargo bed. A translucent ballistic shield unfolded behind the tailgate. Bren's chair swiveled and locked into place. The Barrett sat atop a carbon fiber armature. Bren poked the muzzle through the gun port in the shield. Bullets from the pursuers thudded against the shield and reinforced the tailgate as Bren peered down a digital scope. Lonnie drove a black darts charger, aping an aggressor role established seven decades earlier by another charger in the movie Bullet. Bren locked on the closest vehicle, a decommissioned Ford Explorer police interceptor. Around from the Barrett split the left front wheel and the Explorer rolled over. A pickup truck paced the lightning. A porch pirate attempted to leap from his bed onto Bren's. Bren seized an enforcer, a manual battering ram used by British police. The steel striking plate swung into the porch pirate's chest, reversing his arc. Bren resumed position at his rifle, thinning immediate ranks with carefully placed shots. Talk to me, Ravina, Bren said into his smart watch. You can't outrun them or outgun them, the female voice replied. So what's your better idea? Bren squeezed off another round, cracking an engine block 100 feet away. Your favorite plan B, a shortcut. You'll want to get behind the wheel for this. Bren pressed the button on his seat and slid back into the cockpit. He saw his shortcut on the touch screen, straight up a rocky slope beside the road. Can we handle the incline? 
Yes, if you pick a good line, most of their vehicles won't make it. Most? Bren veered off the road and slowed, allowing the lightning to slip into four-wheel drive high. Porch pirate rounds grazed the bulletproof rear window as the truck climbed the slope. A boulder scraped under the charger, lifting the rear wheels off the ground. Cursing, Lonnie jumped out and continued firing at the lightning. The truck switched to four-wheel drive low as the rockfall steepened. A Suburban lacking the Lightning's upgrades and a driver with Bren's technique slid sideways before tumbling to the bottom, taking out a porch pirate jeep. Sparky, it's up to you, Lonnie said. I got him, Sparky said. A Baja bug bounded up the rocks, a V6 howling in its elongated tail. The bug passed the Lightning and pitched to a stop. Sparky emerged with a grenade launcher. Excited to score the kill, the young porch pirate fired. Bren dodged explosions but surrendered his line. The lightning's wheels spun. He's slipping. Stay on him, Lonnie said to his crew. Bren tapped icons on a secondary system. The front winch activated, shooting a harpoon attached to the steel cable. The harpoon pierced the bug's hood and embedded in the skid plate. The winch turned, yanking the car off its wheels and sending Sparky flying. The enemy vehicle wedged into a rocky cleft, anchoring the cable. The lightning's wheels turned diagonally in crab mode, mode and regained momentum. The harpoon disconnected, the winch line rewinding. The lightning disappeared over the top. Moments later, boulders rumbled toward the remaining porch pirates. Lonnie called a retreat, his squad decimated. Sparky stumbled down the hill. He wrecked my bug, Sparky said. You know how long it took to build. We've all lost a ride we loved. Lonnie put a hand on Sparky's shoulder. Welcome to Porch Pirate Life. <laughs> nice Hello. work. Nice work. <laughs> nice work. Thank you. Thank you. I see Mr. Jason William Karp is here with us. Yeah, let's bring him on. Hang on. Let me see if I can. Jason, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Look how ah, snazzy you ladies look. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> there he is, the yes, man, the myth, yes, the legend, yes. <laughs> Jason Carp. Nice job. Yeah, you you got your college professor look going on right now. It, it's, <laughs> I, I can't help it. it it's <laughs> just what I've evolved into. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, evolved is a good word to describe you. My goodness, you have had like two or three lives worth of, of exciting challenges and changes. And I was telling Brad earlier, you are so not a one-trick pony. I mean, you've got a whole stable's worth of, of exciting stories and talents. And it, it's just really great. Um, so, you know, narrating this story has been exciting. I've been, I've been working on this for a few weeks. And, uh, and when I was writing it, you know, it's just... The, the action of it is just so intense. You just feel like you're there. And I know that sounds trite, but you really do. You know, you're, you're a master of action verbs. And, uh, you know, when I, when I think about this guy, you know, my visual of it, a lot of it has to do with Dorinda Babcock's beautiful cover, which was on our, um, our promo. But uh, I want to throw out a couple of words, and you tell me uh, what this means to you. Uh, we got Maximus, and we got Desperado. <laughs> meaning who I, I was thinking of when I was creating this protagonist. One is Maximus of the movie Gladiator, played by Russell Crowe. <laughs> Academy Award winning performance. And the other persona that um, came to mind was Brenda's Desperado by the Eagles. A song but the character <laughs> is so real the cowboy out riding fences and the key line there you're losing all your highs and lows ain't it funny how the feeling goes away and you put those two together and you put it in the year 2038 and you have the deliverer <laughs> And you got your idea for this book from um, 
a rather unconventional source. You want to elaborate on that? Yes. Um, in reading the news, which I do, oh, let's put it gently, quite a bit. <laughs> always, always been um, a fan of the news ever since I was little. And I read a fascinating and sad story about Amazon contract drivers being graded and fired by AI programs. And it um, immediately sparked something. And I said, oh, welcome to the future. And oh, as we sit back and all enjoy that brown box showing up on the front porch, what's going on behind the scenes to get it there? And, uh, and so that yeah. was the that was the beginning. And uh, you intensified the definition of porch pirates a little bit. Yes. <laughs> um, in the year twenty eight, <laughs> delivery drivers like Bren Van Allen are armed. Porch pirates are still up to their tricks, but they're armed too. And they're not waiting for it to hit the porch. They're intercepting in hijack mode. And that is the world of the deliverer. And you uh, said that your writing fits into a subgenre called high, hard sci-fi. Um, you want to explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I write Christian mm -hmm. sci-fi. And within that, um, I um, am a fan and a writer of a particular brand of science fiction known as hard sci-fi. Very tech heavy, very hardware intensive. And I work hard to come up with um, plausible science behind the things I write about. I don't have anyone snapping their fingers and going across the galaxy. If they're going to cross the galaxy, we're going to explain how they're going to do it. <laughs> and um, it may not be as easy as all that. So um, the great um, hard sci-fi writers of the past, um, and people like um, Arthur C. Clarke, who himself was a scientist, you can really tell that detail. And it is, it is a, a variant of science fiction, and it's always been my favorite and what I aspire to write. Well, you know, I was I was privileged to narrate uh, Basilica Obscura for Wonders of the Galaxy, and um, you know what I was very much struck by that was how tech heavy it was, how um, academic all the uh, discussion of the basilica and all the um, architectural details, and also how you were not afraid to shy away from some pretty intense um topics and uh you know when i read the opening scene i i was scared <laughs> i really was i didn't know what was going to happen to these wonderful girls and uh you know you turned it around with with a, a wonderful character um but but it was a great retelling of the parable of the uh the vineyard workers and i was struck though it was very different from all the other stories that i narrated and i can tell that that hard sci-fi i can tell that you're you know you're you're on a, a different slant and it's exciting because i'd never been exposed to that before um you know oh, we thank well thank you and <laughs> and in turn your um your audiobook reading of basilica obscura mm -hmm. reinvented the story for me oh, thank you <laughs> so it is such a wonderful art form and a wonderful way for book lovers to um, enjoy their books, as we know. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank oh. you both for that that marvelous <laughs> work you did. Okay. Yes, even Basilica Obscura, which um, I'm very proud to say has been nominated for a Realm Award from yes. Realm Makers, the Society of Christian Science Fiction mm -hmm. Fantasy Writers. It takes place a half millennium from now. Yes. And it takes place on a massive spaceship bigger than Rhode Island. Yep. A bio ship mm -hmm. made of synthetic living material that constantly regenerates itself using an M drive, EM, mm -hmm. and taking in dark matter as, it, as it, the, the fuel it consumes to, to push the M drive. 
this is all theoretical. Mm -hmm. Nothing like this exists. Mm -hmm. But I still want it to be authentic for the technology and the society presented. You made me believe it was real. Well, gosh. <laughs> you did. Well, let's just fire up our M drive and <laughs> off we go. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. And and, and I'll tell you what, the um, the mothership, she, she kind of gave me the willies a little bit. I was... I was glad the, that the people ended up running the show by the end of the book. <laughs> by the end of the, it's a novelette, uh, yes. right? <laughs> well, this is a common theme in science fiction. We, yeah. we hand off too much to the machines. Yep. yep. And um, I did not originate that trope, but I ran with it. <laughs> and very and effectively. I, <laughs> you know, a mother is the mother's ship. And that's also a nod for all mm -hmm. my fellow um fans, geeks, whatever you want to call ourselves, <laughs> to the movie Alien. Yeah. Where the, the controlling computer was called Mother mm -hmm. and acted anything but motherly. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I remember, I forget what, what the exact line, but it was something like, you know, I only want the very best for my children. Oh, boy, do I love that boy. <laughs> <laughs> and she passed up planet after planet places where they could live but no she she oh, wanted boy. the very best and it's like you're letting these people die <laughs> it was very absolutely absolutely stuff. that's yeah. also one as as you get into the story one of the per perils of building a ship that's that's a, a, a an artificial organism mm -hmm. even one that's as gigantic as the ship carrying the remnant of humanity across yeah. the stars yeah. and all of that, and you'll see it in the Deliverer too, ties into themes that are very important to me, and that is Christianity along with science fiction. Mm -hmm. And that is my ministry and my great passion. Now, we had a great pre-production chat, and one of the things I asked you was, why do you think uh, Christians are drawn to science fiction. You were talking about how they'll binge watch Star Wars and, and uh, you know, th they secretly are, are so into this, but they don't talk about it. And why do you think that the, um, that the Christians are, are so attracted to the science fiction world and the imagination? We've got the, well, to start with, we've got the ultimate fantastic story, mm -hmm. the Holy Bible. Yeah. All true. Yeah. All fantastic. We as Christians are believers mm -hmm. and we have faith and we stretch our awareness when we follow God's word. Mm -hmm. And science fiction presents many of the same opportunities um, for us to enjoy the story. Yes. And the biggest thing theme throughout science fiction going all the way back to the original novel of Frankenstein over 200 years ago is mm -hmm. people get in trouble mm -hmm. when they play God. Yep. And we see this throughout the Bible and playing God means putting yourself in a position of authority that you don't deserve, mm -hmm. shutting off God and making yep. decisions without him and this is right where you see the great parallel between Christianity and science fiction. So I think, um, I think Christians pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And these cautionary tales, these parables uh, resonate. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you said to me that you don't think Christianity and science should be separated. Correct. Now, tell me what you mean by that. There's a lot of my personal beliefs there's a lot of controversy and argument that um, the scientific world and not everyone subscribes to this but you'll hear this the scientific world and the world of christian faith are two separate things mm -hmm. and adversarial they must not be mm -hmm. we are christ-like when we seek knowledge we are christ-like when we heal and when we improve lives, when we feed people, mm -hmm. as, as Jesus miraculously did, mm -hmm. these things do come through science. Now, at the same time, 
science apart from God makes no sense. Mm. <laughs> and there'll be, there'll be scientists who will um, take exception to that. And there will be scientists who do not. Mm. And it has always been my view that God gave us these minds, the quest for knowledge, and the mandate to emulate Jesus Christ mm. and by doing incredible things. So that's, that is my take on, on Christianity and science hmm. being side by side. Well, you know, we, we throw out words like fantastic, and we don't really think about, you know, what that actually means. We think of it just as being good or great, but it has a very specific, you know, uh, definition. And, uh, you know, if, if you really look at what Jesus did, you know, it, there is an element where you might step back and say, that couldn't be true. That couldn't have happened. You know, that has to be somebody's fantasy. That's too, you know, too much. How could you possibly feed 5,000 people from a few loaves of bread and a couple fish? I mean, how is that possible? And, um, you know, one of the things I like about really good fiction, especially sci-fi, is the ability to suspend disbelief. But I find that it has mm -hmm. to make sense. You know, I mean, you, you, yeah. it doesn't work if it sounds too, um, too easy or, you know, trite, hackneyed, you know. It has to be something exciting that, that makes your mind agree with the premise. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's one of the things I really like about venturing because I'm not a sci-fi reader. I've never read a sci-fi book until I started doing the narration for Wonders of the Galaxy. And it just opened my mind to a whole different possibility and the creative retelling but I think there is a lot to be said for the, the, the dichotomy between the, the scientific world and the, and the Christian world. And people are afraid to let those intersect. And, uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to have your take on it. And, um, you know, you, you do this um, not only in your writing, but you do this through your teaching. And I, I was wondering, you know, if you would want to talk a little bit about um, Christian sci-fi with Professor K. I have a um, study course that I do. I live in Minnesota at churches and mm -hmm. schools, and it's called Christian Sci-Fi Night with Professor K. And yes, <laughs> I am Professor K. <laughs> I, te I, I teach um, at colleges and uh, many Christian schools around the country. I specialize in online courses. And I teach marketing, communication, fundraising, public speaking and media studies and i write and love science fiction mm -hmm. so in this um in this live course we um we watch um episodes of classic and contemporary science fiction twilight zone uh, original star trek a uh, few things from the um, Star Wars canon as, as it is expanded um, greatly on, on streaming media. Mm -hmm. And then we, we talk about it as Christians. And we don't sacrifice anything. We do not sacrifice our enjoyment mm -hmm. of these stories of the fantastic. And we do not sacrifice our faith and our status as Christians. Mm -hmm. And I, it is my ministry to show, again, these things coming together. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. as Christians, we're not supposed to say, thou shalt not, mm -hmm. when there, there's so much um, cool content out there. Mm -hmm. And okay. at the same time, we're not supposed to say, well, I better, um, better um, flick off the Christian switch so I can enjoy my guilty pleasure. Okay, break out the laser blasters mm -hmm. and the spaceships. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. It all goes together. And this is the great time that we have. Hmm. You know, Brett, just last night at his show, and he said it many times, you know, this is a, a wonderful time to be alive. So many people are doomsdayers and, oh, you know, it's not the way it used to be and this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, that's true. You and I could not have had this conversation. <laughs> And, you know, 15 years ago, we'd have been like, what? You know what I mean? Like, it would have been very challenging. And now we're able to do this, and it's so much fun. You know, Minnesota is, is a little bit of a trip from Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, you know, it's creative minds and scientific minds that make all this happen. You know, it doesn't have to be a threat. No, 
No. If you're watching this on Facebook, if you're watching it on your mobile device, thank, um, thank centuries of scientists for putting mm -hmm. that in our hands. Exactly. And that doesn't mean we bow down right. to the altar of science. Mm -hmm. But we understand the role it plays in our lives. And we also understand the dangers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not every scientific advance is healthy or good. And that's very much where our Christian hearts and minds come into play. Mm -hmm. The morality behind it, the choices. Yeah. A, a blend, in, in my mind, is absolutely necessary as well as entirely possible mm -hmm. and welcome. Well, you said the sciences, when they're done right, make us closer to the creator. Mm hmm. Yeah, very well. Completely. Said. Well, I mean, think about it. Think about the miracles of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Think about the power of healing. Think how that power was given to the apostles in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And think about the mandate we have to feed, to heal, to cure disease. As far as I'm concerned, it is our ongoing efforts to be christ-like yes and i think telling stories that uh that draw people back to the lord is also um a christ-like quality because that was his power tool right storytelling <laughs> well uh, jesus is the master storyteller and i am honored to be a writer mm -hmm. and to write in his name absolutely absolutely now you are not the only writer in your family though true <laughs> uh let's talk a little bit about your mom um brett just oh, about goody, goody gum drops. He, he just about um the message he sent me it, it could have been dynamite it was that exciting uh when he found out your mom wrote gargoyles he was like you've got to be kidding me we were one of the first people in our area to have a vcr and we taped that and all my friends would watch it tell us a little about your your brilliant and accomplished mom and her influence on you Absolutely. I learned to write at home. It was the family business. My mother went home to Jesus in 2013. Her name was Eleanor, mm -hmm. known by the people who love her as, as Ellie, mm -hmm. as well as mom and grandma. Mm -hmm. um, she was a successful screenwriter for over 30 years mm -hmm. and, and um, studied at Northwestern University, came out to California to get into show business and did so successfully in the mid 1960s when I was a little boy. And one of the um, one of the pieces she wrote was a TV movie in 1972 called Gargoyles, <laughs> which has been a classic for 50 years. <laughs> and it's on the premise that all the gargoyles that you see in statues all over the cathedrals of Europe and creatures, similar looking creatures in Middle Eastern um, culture and ruins and so on, had a biological origin and really did exist. And the premise is every 500 years, the gargoyles hatch and try and take over the world. <laughs> that and what do you know? In 1972 yikes. in the New Mexico desert, here they go again. And the most, the most, the, the, the coolest, one of the coolest scenes in that movie is when they're in the cave and they're in the where the eggs are and they yes. and, and they really your mom really wrote this human um component to these gargoyles very well because they're you know of course they want to protect their eggs and their family and there's a moment in there jason if i'm correct me if i'm wrong i'm going off a of memory i haven't seen this in a long time but when the male gargoyle sitting on the, i i I think I remember him sitting on a throne-ish type seat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there was the female there, and they were kind of consoling each other. It was close to the end of the movie. And he kind of gives her a pat on the rump, like, you know, hey, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Am, am I right about that? Am I remembering that correctly? Oh, you're totally right. Be because also um, the, the Gargoyle King has kidnapped the, Diana. the beautiful college-age daughter of the professor. Yeah. Um, Diana who is the only person who is who is aware of the threat and is able to stop it. Yes. Uh, and Sorry. and and his mate um, is none too happy about um, 
the gargoyle king's wandering eyes. So yeah, he has to comfort her, and he gets her a little um, love pat. Yeah. I... And <laughs> oh, you 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 remembered it well. Yes, I did. So anyway, back. I, I had to interject there just momentarily. Well, what's great about that? No, is no, that... that's that's all part of it. So. So my mom, Eleanor, wrote this movie, and it was on 50 years ago. Stan Winston, the late um, spe- uh, makeup and special effects um, master, Oscar winner himself, won an Emmy for this. This was his breakthrough. Mm-hmm. So if you've seen The Terminator mm-hmm. and James Cameron's sequel to Alien, Aliens, as in more than one, you've Aliens. seen the magnificent work of Stan Winston, wow. which, um, which came to prominence of creating the creatures of gargoyles. That's pretty cool. I love it. Well, you know what this whole this whole conversation impressed on me though is that, you know, your mom's creative imagination in this story made such an impact on Brett, you know, as a as a kid, as a teen, that he can tell you the details of it. He probably hasn't watched that movie in twenty years. Uh I try f- 30, 40, try forty four years and it stuck with him <laughs> it stuck with him it's, it sticks with you though <laughs> wait a minute wait, 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 wait. did i say 40 years <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> uh, Brett, Brett, it's just it's just the three of us and all of cyberspace That's right. <laughs> I, I, i'm not bashful about it at all i love being where i'm at in life well you know you got it. i i um you also have a, a background in Hollywood, not just your mom. And uh, Bill Bixby played a role in your childhood. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Oh, another um, another great talent who's no longer with us. Yeah. The first thing I, I grew up in the entertainment industry, obviously, is um, you know talking about my mom, the screenwriter. And the first thing I did in um, in in um, in in show business, I was a kid actor, and this is going back fifty years when I was a kid. Speaking of which, Brad. Yeah, I got you, man. I got um, you. I'm hearing you. Yeah, okay. Let's, oh, let's all go down memory lane. Let's go down and, there. And the, we don't well, have to throw around go. numbers. I guess, and I guest starred on um, the courtship of Betty's father, which Bill Bixby started. I and love he that directed show too. the episode. It was a wonderful, wonderful show. And wonderful people involved. And Bill Bixby directed the episode I was in. And he was a marvelous director. Mm-hmm. Because when it comes to acting and you're a kid, you're doing something at the level of an adult. I mean, you're mm-hmm. playing kids and you know, and that sort of thing, but you're going to work. Mm-hmm. And there is responsibility and pressure on you. And, and most children don't do that. And, um, but if you're an actor and you're young, you're right in it. And the director, uh, when you're directing kids, has to be so exact to get the performance, but make that child feel safe and comfortable. Even if it's, you know, a, an action um, a movie or show um, like Bonanza that I was also on. That was pretty heavy duty. There were people shooting and stalking and, you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, you can be a kid in, in a pretty heavy story, but Courtship of Eddie's Father, um, a comedy, and Bill Bixby was such a great director. He made me feel safe, and he showed me how to give the performance that he saw using my tools as a young actor and it was it was an experience i'll remember always so mm. a great talent in front of and behind the camera was bill bixby mm. bill bixby <laughs> yeah that's really great to hear it's encouraging to hear and um you know you obviously were raised in a home with a lot of intelligence and and good minds and reading and you had some rather um interesting uh book preferences as a young man you know you're going to work on bonanza and and then you come home and you like to read the world almanac and the guinness book of world records and that ended up paying off didn't it yeah it took a few (laughs) 
Feel free to continue, Jason. <laughs> Please answer in the form of a question. <laughs> Thank you. It's my favorite thing to play. <laughs> now that get, everyone sing along. Not, not, not that I know. <laughs> yes, that was the theme song to Jeopardy, <laughs> and. Uh, Jeopardy was a milestone for me in the year 2000. I was blessed to be on it, and um, and I won four times. I was on the show um, for the full five-show cycle that you could do as pre-Ken Jennings. I won four times. And what got me there was back in the Bonanza days, my favorite books were The World Almanac and The Guinness Book of World Records. I just love pouring over the minutia. I love knowing what was the tallest building, the biggest dam, the longest bridge, (laughs) and going into the um, concentrated um, history sections of the World Almanac. And, yeah, I was that kid, okay? (laughs) Guilty. I was, yeah, 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 I was him. Um, But uh, many years later, people always said, well, why don't you go on Jeopardy? And, I, you know... um, I mean, I remember Jeopardy from when Art Fleming was the host. Again, we're, once again, we're on memory lane. We're not getting off anytime soon. And then, of course, (laughs) the wonderful era with the late Alex Trebek. And finally, I ran out of excuses and I tried out and I got on. Mm -hmm. And it was another life changing moment. But there was something, there was a certain category that uh, kind of catapulted you into uh, prominence on that and success on that. And it had nothing to do with the Guinness Book of World Records, did it? No, no. It, it, it part of misspent youth. They should have that. <laughs> Listen up, Brett. Misspent youth for $2 million, please. I mean, really. I was in my first game and it was nip and tuck. <laughs> and I was up against an English major who did really well on the Charles Dickens category. And I'm thinking, boy, I better make up some make up some ground. And then in um, Double Jeopardy, they had the category. Brett, wait for it. <laughs> rock album covers. Yes. <laughs> Say yeah! rock album cover. <laughs> and I said, and I said, OK, you know, um, you know, stomp the clutch crank the <laughs> stick shift we're going we're, we're going full tilt so i was able to run the table on that one i answered uh, every single one of them got in the lead and that that sent me to winning my first game but um again you know i was i was going to be a rock star and maybe that didn't quite work out but boy it it, it came in handy on jeopardy <laughs> later <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, um, you definitely used your earnings from that show in a way that has impacted lives probably more than if you had become a rock star. <laughs> let's let's hear about Well, more of a quiet, uh, in a quiet sense. But um, <laughs> the reason Jeopardy was was such a, a pivotal moment for me, I was a college dropout. I was 38 years old. I left. I went to college at the um, appointed age of eighteen. Mm-hmm. Dropped out not long after. And being on Jeopardy reawakened my love of learning. Mm-hmm. So um, when my check came, and yes, they just send you a check for what you win. Mm-hmm. And it comes in the mail, just like your your um, utility bill used to, where you could pay all that online. And I banked it, and that week I enrolled at the local community college. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going back. Mm -hmm. And 10 years after that, give or take, I um, had three degrees and I was teaching college. Mm -hmm. Uh, And of course, a a little thing in the middle where I had to be your typical college guy noticing a beautiful blonde in class. (laughs) And what do you know? I ended up marrying her. So... And this happens all the time. Okay, <laughs> by that time I was in my fourth and I had two kids. But same thing, college college boy not not paying attention to his studies notices uh, the, the cute cute lady and, and well so I did that too. All right, let's uh let's take a break and uh we'll we'll sign Jason off. 
get him on the next Zoom link. Uh, you can give a little couple of your tips and tricks, and we'll okay. bring Jason back on. Okay, Jason, you'll come back with us and answer some questions. In a minute. All right. Thanks, All right, Jason. Man. We're going to go ahead and log you off of there. I'll turn the <laughs> camera back over to Christy Lou, and we'll see Jason back here in just yes, a moment. We will see Jason in a moment. What an incredible life story, isn't that? It's so man, exciting. Oh man, for sure. Oh, and he's so humble about it. I love that about him. Um, okay, so the narrator uh, tips and tricks um, section of the show is on, and I really, I have a few things I want to say. One of them, I've just sort of developed a new system, and it's working well for me. Uh, one of the things that I'm always tempted to do is I always practice uh, before I go to the mic, obviously. And when I rehearse, it seems like I'm tempted to read too many pages. And then I find that I'm really not getting anywhere. All I'm figuring out is, oh, well, this is supposed to be whispered or this is supposed to be murmured or whatever. But it's, it doesn't give me a good sense of the actual um, words because it's so easy to trip over your own tongue, no matter how careful you are. And, and it also is very easy for your brain to switch a word or to omit a word and you don't realize it until you're hearing the recording. So what I've started doing is rehearsing one page. One, I, I, I use PDFs, and so one page, I'll narrate it aloud three times, and then I record it and edit it, and then I move forward. And it's been working well for me. I have fewer mistakes, and I've noticed that it's more fluid. So, um, you know, everybody has their own system, but that's working well for me. You know, read it out loud three times, record one page at a time, edit it, move on. Um, Another thing that I think is is important to think about, because we have advertised this as something that if you want to get into narrating, you can learn from me, you can learn from the authors. Um, one thing is there's like four sections, there's four parts of narrating. And, um, you know, the best way that I know to teach you how to narrate is to listen to good audiobooks. You know, really just find them. I'm a big fan of Jim Dale. He's the best, in my opinion, because he's not just a narrator. He's a vocal actor, and he has developed more voices than, uh, than anybody that I know. Who is Jim and, Dale? Uh, <laughs> Who is, uh, some people might not know. Who is Jim he Dale? He narrated the Harry Potter series, and he also narrated the Arthur series. Um, I just recently listened to that, Arthur and the Minimoys and Arthur and the Forbidden City, and it is a brilliant children's book. And, uh, and really exciting stuff, um, very creative, extremely creative. But he has this ability to capture the emotion and create voices that's better than anybody I know. And so I'm studying him just by listening. Um, so, you know, the, the four parts, though, of, of narrating are being able to read smoothly and with a pleasant tone. Uh, the vocal acting, like Jim Dale does, you know, creating voices and really tapping into the emotion. I think that's what separates the pros from the pretenders is the ability to really grab the listener by the gut. Because that's what the author has done, but you have the ability to add another dimension with your voice. Um, and then there's the editing, which is on me, my end of it, fixing stammers, um, mispronunciations, things like that. Um, and, and with the vocal acting, accent work. You know, learning how to do accents. And then the fourth part is the mastering. And that's what Brett does for me. You know, converting files from WAVE to MP3. Um, tightening up gaps because my cadence might be slightly different from one take to another. And if there's a little, just even just a little millisecond of, of gap, you'll notice that when you're listening. So things like that. But, um, you know, if you're looking for a good education, listen to good audiobooks. And uh, if you are, you know, looking to, you know, to get into this, just start talking to yourself aloud. You know, find a tone. Because this is my normal speaking voice, but I have learned how to adapt a smoother sound for my narrating voice. And it was just something that I learned by practicing it and doing it. And something that I wanted to be pleasant to the ear. And, uh, and so that's something that I've just learned to develop. And if you feel called to do this, if you love storytelling, but you're not necessarily a writer, you want to add dimension to stories, you can figure out how to find your own voice, too. So those are my narrative tips great. and tricks. That is a really great, I think it's your best tip and trick segment I've seen yet or Thank heard you. yet. Thank you. 
Awesome stuff, kid. Thank hey, Jason. Appreciate that. Hi, if Jason. I didn't want to rush you. I didn't mean to do no, that. It's okay. Let you know. It's okay. Okay, you ready? Ready, bring, bring. Okay, let's I'm bring ready. Jason back into the Welcome feed. Welcome back, we go. Jason, four-time Jeopardy champ, Bonanza child star, worked with Bill Bixby, and he's been married for 16 years to the beautiful blonde Annie that he met in college. Round of applause for Jason and Andy. Annie, sorry, Annie. So, oh, Andy. no, not Andy, sorry, Annie. Um, you said to me, the overall impact of Jeopardy was to show you that you are capable of doing what you thought you couldn't do. See, I don't think he's with us. That? No, I'm, all right, can you see me? Oh, yes, yeah, we're yes, good. yes, yeah, yes. Christy's freaking out, we got sorry. you. Sorry. All right, all right. Well, let's um, let's um, have at it. Yes, that was the big development of Jeopardy. Was it just it, it it blew up everything I thought about myself, and and remember, I grew up in Hollywood. I had been on television, but the uniqueness of Jeopardy. And what it meant to me at that point in my life. And it wasn't about the obvious wins on the show. It wasn't about the money, which has been long spent. <laughs> it was about having the ability to be surprised with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I took that and I ran with it because I wanted to do more. I went back to school. I found an incredible woman and she introduced me to the most incredible person of all time, Jesus Christ, all man, all God. And none of these things would I have considered as possible, but it wasn't a matter of considering it or planning it. It was letting go. And I have found that that is so important to the Christian walk, emptying ourselves, being that vessel for God. And I think it's, it's a willingness to, to grow also. You, you have, you have to be ready for more. And you can do that in a very positive spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, we all work on ourselves and say, well, I got to do this or I got to be better at that, but embrace it. Mm -hmm. And um, I went for so many years thinking I had leveled off with life, made my choices. They didn't work out. Here are the consequences. But um, I didn't settle for that. But only after I declared Jesus Lord and Savior, did I realize his hand was on me. Hmm. And this is what he teaches all of us. Hmm. He, he taught us and the apostles hmm. yeah. being reborn, having our resurrection. Hmm. Again, like we we're yes. saying earlier, being Christ-like. Yes. I, um, you know, I, when I, when I think about, about what you're talking about, you know, you might have looked at yourself, you know, at, at some point in your life, maybe when you were in your music days or when you went into marketing as opposed to writing and all these different um, stops along your journey, you know, I think you might have looked at yourself and said, mm, I don't know, I don't really think I'm living the way I'm supposed to. I don't think this is who I want to be, but I don't know how to get to where I should be. And, you know, right. it, part of it was Jeopardy. Part of it was meeting your wife. Part of it went back to those band days. You know, I mean, being part of the band, you learn the rock album covers. I mean, the whole journey. And, and one of the things that, that makes me um, love Jesus is that if you're listening and you're paying attention to what he wants you to do, He's not going to come up behind you and whack you, you know, with a stick to get you to do what he wants. He, he's going to start by just holding his hand out. And 
and then he might have to gently touch you on the shoulder. But he always mm -hmm. starts out with the gentle touch. And, you know, if you're paying attention, you're willing to grow. And like you said, willing to let go and be empty, he can, you know, use you to influence more and more people. And, um, and I think that influence is one of the biggest gifts about being a writer is that you don't know who's going to pick up that book where or when and what they're coming to that book with because i think everybody who reads they they want something out of it mm -hmm. you know they're looking i think primarily for escape especially a sci-fi book you know you're looking to be transported somewhere and um you know i i really yeah. like your your honesty about finding this story out in the news and and finding something that could be really negative and yet figuring out a way. I mean, in this scene, Bren is transporting medical equipment, you know, pieces of equipment mm -hmm. that are used for saving lives, you know. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful thing. And any any circumstance can be used in a good way for God if you're open to it. And I think your life is a really good example of that. <laughs> Well, um, I appreciate that so much. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Warren mm -hmm. will often say, God never wastes a hurt. Oh, yeah. So yeah. when you think about dead ends, failures, mistakes, mm -hmm. there was a reason. Yeah. And all of it to remember the power is with God. Mm -hmm. And to remember his holy word teaches us it's going to be tough. But that's intentional and how we are refined. Mm. And the fact that now I'm writing fiction, um, yeah, Christian science fiction, but I'm going back to being a storyteller, which is what mm. I originally wanted to do. Yeah. But I couldn't have done it without God. I couldn't have done it without my initial experience in Hollywood. Mm. I couldn't do it, have done it without having left the industry. And mm and felt um, all those choices didn't pay off and et cetera, et cetera. No, they were just waiting for the refinement. And when you come to know Jesus, you come to know that process and you know he is not finished with you yet. Mm -hmm. How else could this broken world work? Mm -hmm. How else could we be his beloved children? Mm -hmm. I've learned it personally. And so you know, we you hear testimony, witness all the time. Mm -hmm. And being a part of helping others find that there is no greater purpose, no greater joy. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Science fiction in particular is an escape. But the best science fiction always puts real characters mm -hmm. in that story of the fantastic. Mm -hmm. So that the reader can say, wow, I could be that person. Yes. What would I do? Mm -hmm. And um, and so we so we are transported mm -hmm. to the, these incredible worlds. And I think I will add to that the best stories are things that you find you've actually learned something from. And then you find out, wow, I had a chance to apply that understanding somewhere, it, you know, at the moment you least expect it. Um, but that's where, you know, just really learning the craft of writing and being the best storyteller you can be. And, you know, you said, I asked you who your audience is, who your target audience is. And you said, it's, it's people my age and it's people in their twenties. Um, and I find that mm -hmm. really interesting. Why do you think it appeals, it appeals to such a, a breadth of, of, uh, of readers? The, the, the bridge, Christianity mm -hmm. and science fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, full disclosure, I'm 60 years old, in case you're wondering about the math and talking about this 50 years ago and everything else. <laughs> I watched Star Trek TOS, which us cool nerds call it, in the original <laughs> series. First run with my brilliant sci-fi fan mother in the late 60s. I was on the set of Gargoyles when I was 10 years old. And I love all the old shows and movies and people my age, give or take, grew up loving it, too. Mm -hmm. and I can't tell you all the times, you know, I'm at church or life group. And this was before I started writing. And we would just talk about these great 
sci-fi stories we grew up with. That's the one one um, target market. Younger people are growing up with the same thing. Mm -hmm. Star Wars and Star Trek are as big, if not bigger than ever. Yeah. And with the um, streaming media spinoffs, mm -hmm. they're wonderful to watch. And being able to watch the old classic um, standards of both canons. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you all the students I've had over the years. And, and we get into the same conversations that I will with all the grandpas in life group you know same thing we're talking about the same stuff we love <laughs> and there's a great commonality there yeah so that's why i have the two target markets hmm. they have a lot in common yeah <coughs> well you know ideally a child crawls up in your lap and says tell me a story and I think that's something that that crosses all age barriers. Um, you know, it's 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 mm -hmm. a it's a beautiful thing for somebody to use their creative imagination and create a world and draw you into it to the point that you're thinking about it when you've put the book down or when you've turned the audio book off. You're like, what's going to happen to Bren? Is he going to make it? I mean, are these guys going to steal this? Stuff? What's going to happen to these kids? You know, and, and that's a goal. And, and that's, I'm sure, a goal of yours. And uh, and it's something oh, that, yes. um, you know, it's exciting. And, and this book is, is going to be out in just a few weeks, isn't it? Well, I, and I'm, I'm so proud and so excited, mm -hmm. and I want people to put themselves in the world of the Deliverer. Mm -hmm. Bren Van Allen, the top star driver, mm -hmm. and all of this battling between the armed drivers and the armed porch pirates, you, um, you heard it when Christy Lou read it, is streamed 24-7. It is the most popular reality TV show in um, in what's now known as greater America. In in the world of 2038, America has been torn to pieces. And Bren Van Allen is trying to earn a living while being this, this um, 21st century gladiator. He's an evangelist. He has been, a, he's a lifelong believer. And as Christians, I want, uh, I want um, us all to be able to look at this story and say, how could a good Christian be in the middle hmm. of all this madness you're describing? And that's just the point. And if it helps anyone reading, well, I'm, I'm a Christian in the middle of my madness. Hmm. And to get hope from it and realize God is everywhere. And that's why <laughs> um, Bren drives and evangelizes too as as this um as a celebrity across what is now three americas three united uh, ver three portions of the united states their own countries and some independent republics mm -hmm. he wants to get the word out using his uh his ability to influence i love it i love it yeah he knows he knows and that's how he was drawn into it hmm it's interesting that you would say God is everywhere. Brett and I just had a conversation about we that did, the other night. Yeah. yeah. And he said that exact thing. And not everybody understands what that means. It's a deeper way, I think, of approaching faith. And it's what we have to remember. And um, like I said, with Christian Sci-Fi Night with Professor K, God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Including in these cool stories that we don't have, again, we don't have to flip flip off the Christian switch to enjoy. No, turn it up. Enjoy even more. Yeah. Grow. I think it I think authenticity is something that some people are afraid to own. You know, they they want to be one person in church and another person after they go home and you know, we we talked about that. Is that that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, we have to be genuine. No. And, uh, and that's something Brett and I have talked about yeah. a lot, too, is being genuine, you know, owning who you are, not being afraid. But, I mean, in a way, though, that shows your faith, that shows who you are without feeling mm -hmm. like you have to cloak yourself up in, in, in holiness. But also, you know, not to be afraid to, you know, to use what you are interested in to reach out to people who may not be interested in Jesus, but they come to see that you're different and um you know, to me, the most non-threatening way is just stories. <laughs> it's just the best. 
<laughs> it's the best. Somebody who won't well, go to church will pick up your book. You know? Well, and that's the whole thing. Why did Jesus use parables? Yeah. So that people would be drawn in. That's right. So it wasn't someone, you know, I mean, okay, Moses got up there with the tablets and a lot of thou shalt not. Yep. Um, Jesus said, I have fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. We're taking a different approach. We're not disregarding it. Yeah. I'm the fulfillment. Yeah. And we are going to get to the essence of what God's law is. And again, being Christ-like, mm -hmm. being authentic, being loving, mm -hmm. and and knowing that all of us are in ministry and how how exciting that is. Yeah. Hmm. Well said. Well Poor said. Lord. Love that. Well, and well said by you. Well said by you. What oh, you and Brett you. were talking about is absolutely true. Thank you. You know, being authentic and God being everywhere. <laughs> and my ministry leading up to my, 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 my novel writing as a college instructor. I teach marketing. I teach PR. And it's very easy to say these are the most godless <laughs> pursuits. Isn't marketing <laughs> all about a bunch of lies and fluff to get people to buy stuff they don't need and can't afford? It has been my ministry to show how the Christian approach to marketing is the best way. I call that creative. And not just, oh, what's, that? what's that? No, I, I, I just, I just uh, I blurted out. Sorry about that. I, I, I call that creative capitalism, contribution capitalism. A absolutely. And it is for maximum benefits. So yes. being a Christian marketer is not a matter of, well, you're the nice guy, you finish last, but... No. Jesus loves. You. No, no. It is Not about fulfilling needs and delivering value. That's and so exactly I've been teaching right. that for for over ten years already, and that has been a huge driver for me to write Christian sci-fi, Christian science fiction. Nah, yes, <laughs> just the way Christian marketing. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you said it was an exchange of value. And if people can just look at it that way, as opposed to, you know, trading money for, you know, a good or service right. to just look at it as, as exchanging value. I think that's a very eye opening concept for marketing. I like and that when a you lot. Lift, and when you lift up your customers, you're going to make more money. Yeah. You know, in the American in, 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 in the American capitalist system, which is still the best in the world. Amen. 100%. But, you, but you, you do better by doing better by your customers, lifting them up, giving them real value, protecting exactly. them. Which is Make what is, is, is this, Good. You know, is it, uh, go ahead, Brett. I was just going to say uh, one, of the, one of the golden rules I learned uh, a long time ago when I was going through personal development and studying business and whatnot was, um, you know, if you can make others feel better about their life and themselves – when they leave your presence yeah. than when they first showed up. Mm -hmm. um, not only are you doing the right thing, you're going to do the thing, the thing that lifts all, uh, all involved, and you'll never go hungry. In fact, you'll flourish. Yep. Yes. Yes, you will. So we, by embracing that, it's not a matter of, well, again, I better turn off my Christian switch if I want to sell this, make a living. Get, keep this company in the black. No, turn it up. <laughs> so I, I love hearing what both of you are saying. Simply yeah. put, it's true. <laughs> well, we've enjoyed talking to you so much, Jason. Do we have any questions? Um, you know, I was going to say, we. I think you guys, Jason speaks so well and so <laughs> thoroughly, and you've asked such wonderful questions. We haven't had any yet. I've had it pinned out there for... A little while, but uh, hey, guys, we are moving into the uh, Q&A section of the show now. So if you didn't see the pinned comment uh, and you have a question, uh, go ahead and jump in there and ask the question. Now, I do have a couple of comments. I'm going to turn the camera back over to you guys. Um, let me see if I can find these comments. Jason, I have really enjoyed. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one from Dorinda. Of all the publishers. Dorinda. Yes, Dorinda Babcock. Of all the publishers you could have signed with, why did you sign with Elk Lake Publishing? Ooh, Ooh. 
one. Good one. <laughs> oh boy, do I I love answering this. Mm. I finished the manuscript in the year 2020. Yes, like a lot of people, I was um, um, <laughs> in my bunker during the pandemic writing my novel, my first novel. I found out a lot of people were doing that, and I wanted to hire an editor um, because good editing is, you, you enjoy a book you've read, thank the author, thank the editors. It is a team sport. So I knew I wanted to, I wanted to hire an editor and then see what would come of the book. Um, and I found um, resources for Christian editors and I contacted them, you know, to say, here's what I've got. What is your time frame? What are your rates? And there was one um, editing company that I sent the manuscript to and the lady who owned that company said, you know, I don't have time to edit your book, but here's this. It was a publishing contract mm -hmm. for L. Plate Publishing. Mm -hmm. The lady, the owner of the editing company, also the owner of the publishing house, mm -hmm. Deb Haggard, mm -hmm. who's been a guest on this show. And it happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anyone to think, well, I just snapped my fingers and it was easy. No, it was a God thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and Deb said, you know, um, I understand if you're not ready to sign, this is awful quick. Um, but I really enjoy this book. And so, you know, I talked to a couple of, I looked up a couple of L. Flakes publishers, I mean, excuse me, authors on the publishing website. And if you want to learn more about L. Flake publishing, log in and, um, and see the list of wonderful authors. Yes. That um, that are are proud to carry the um, Elk Lake brand. I contacted a couple of them and I said, "Well, tell me about this outfit." And I liked what I heard. Great Godly, answer. Great answer. That's really smart. talented and champions. They'll fight. They'll they'll you'll be a better writer and they'll fight for you. Hmm. And that's all I needed to hear. So I I signed with Deb and haven't looked back. <laughs> and as I have said, and you even read my quote when you're interviewing Deb, I can call myself a Christian author. And what a blessing that is. Thanks to Elk Lake. Yeah. Huh. All right, I have another one. Okay. All right. Sherry Lash. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sherry. Earlier hi. in the comments, she said, she's like, Jason was talking about the episode where he was like ran the table with the, with the uh, category of rock. Yes, album covers yes yes and she's like i remember that episode well <gasps> wow so she was watching the episode and oh my goodness. she wants to know how it was what it was like uh how it was for you meeting alex trebek alex trebek was as much of a star <laughs> as tom hanks or going back in time um burt lancaster i oh, mean yeah. he's just a giant of media hmm. and um, obviously, and, and again, I've met people in my life, you know, and in, in my upbringing, but you never get over being starstruck, even if you grow up in Hollywood, because when someone is a genuine star, everyone feels it. And this was the case with Alex Trebek. Hmm. I can say that he was the real deal, hmm. a true intellectual, a uh, true renaissance man. He knew the world of Jeopardy. And nobody had that wonderful command of the game so that we could all play our hearts out and so the audience would love it the way they have year after year. But he's a very, very talented man, um, um, even beyond his host demeanor. We would go on break uh, as we were taping and they would put in a commercial break and where they just turn off the cameras and we'd wait 90 seconds. It was almost, you know, shooting it step by step. And during those interludes, he'd walk out the front of the stage and keep the audience warmed up. He'd mm. crack jokes. Oh, wow. He'd do impersonation. <laughs> and you think, wow, well, the state stately. 
wow. you know, the stately host of Jeopardy, he'd be right out there at the edge of the stage, even though it takes tremendous energy to host the show and perform. Oh, wow. He knew he had to keep that energy up for the people. That's so cool. And he was just going a mile a minute. And they count them back in. Okay, Alex, five, four, three, <sighs> and welcome back. You know, and oh, wow. and just hit that mark. A, a, a remarkable man. I always, and, I always uh, thought of him as a class act. I mean, oh, just yeah. watching him, yeah. you know. Very, he, you can, no, nobody could phony baloney that. You just can't phony baloney that. You know exactly. what I mean? It's, it was just class exactly. shows. Exactly. No, it, it, it really does. And Jeopardy is an institution. I mean, we, we always talk about how um, stuff on TV, well, that's garbage, that's rotting your mind. And, <laughs> of course, they've been saying that since they've hooked up the first television set. You know, I'm sure, yeah. All those years. <laughs> For sure. Point taken. Point taken. But Jeopardy always aspired to be more. And that's why I loved it when I was a kid and um, was so honored to be on the show. I have, it, I, I it have is an institution. Oh. And he and he he was he was he, he was the man. All right. I'm going to be the other end of the spectrum. OK. Oh, goodness. I'm yeah. going to be the other end of the spectrum. I used to sit my mom. Pat Morgan, oh. my mom. Oh, let me get that out of there. We only got 10 minutes left. But my mom, is a, she could have been on Jeopardy and run the gate, too. Yep. She is amazing, okay? And my mom, I used to get so mad. We'd be sitting in the living room, and mom would be in cooking dinner. And it would be on, and she'd like be, you know, doing. A, she'd be making hamburgers. She'd be doing the patties. And the question, the, the, the question would come up, and, and they're like, they didn't even finish the question, and I'm like concentrating just to hear the question, so I could maybe, maybe, and she like she go like, oh, what is blah blah blah, and I'd be like, are you kidding me? He didn't even get the whole thing out, <laughs> and so I I don't think I ever answered one Jeopardy question in my life, and I no matter where I mean no matter where I was watching when I was watching I watched all through my life, and I just get frustrated and change the channel, because I, I I never answered one not one. No. Every household's got one of them. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> the people who love me. I was that guy. Yeah, I, I saw in the comments just a minute ago, just a minute ago in our comments, Sherry said um, she was that person <laughs> at her house too. There's always somebody. Your mom was that person. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My mom was that. Oh, and, and to to this day, people won't watch the show with me. You know, I love to sit down every now and again and watch. Uh, and, uh, you know, Annie's like, mm. and she loves the show, but you, Lord help us if I walk in. So, well, here goes this afternoon. You know, you just you can't help yourself. Yeah. Well, I tell you, if I knew all if I knew all the answers, I'd be like, I'd be bowling everybody over. Yeah, I got this. I got this one. I got this. Oh, hey, we've man. only yeah, got a couple you know. of minutes left. Um, we're gonna run out of Zoom time. And we're going to run out of Facebook okay. time, and we're going to run out. Of, uh, Jason, we Thank could you. we could sit here, we could sit here and talk to you all night, and we, we may could. just do that sometime. <laughs> just just do a Zoom. I think we'll Zoom. work that out one way or another. <laughs> yeah, I think we could just do I, a I, Zoom I marathon. Oh, oh, better than that, I'm coming out to Pennsylvania. You're going to hear me banging on the bar door. I'm going to have my bass with me. Oh, <laughs> and bring, yes, bring the Mark bass my with words. you. Yes, indeed. Bring the bass with you, and uh, we with will do jam session, our wives there. It's uh. going to be great. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> going to be awesome, sir. Heck, absolutely. He's, he's got well, a... Well, God bless, God bless you both. Thank oh, you for having me on. Thank you. It was a and real pleasure. thank you for the ongoing showcase for my home as an author, Elk Lake Publishing, <laughs> a, a godly, independent Christian publisher that's doing great things, and I am so proud to be part of it. Awesome. All right, buddy. We'll see you, thank you next Jason. time. Continued success to you and your family. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch soon, I'm sure. Uh, I am sure of that. You bet. Thanks, Dave. Right, well, very best to both of you. Thank God you. Bless. God bless. Bye-bye now. Bye.